I'm going to talk about a couple of topics that we have worked on over the past uh, two years, uh, mainly on best arm identification in our stochastic uh, bandits. Specifically, I'll be focusing on recent results on optimality and, and uh, depending on how much time I'll have on the robustness aspect. And these are mainly the work of uh, my PhD student, Arpan Mukherjee, uh, that he has been the, the force behind it. All right. So we are considering the canonical uh, bandit models. That is, we have an environment and a learner. So the learner at this time identifies one of the arms, uh, pulls the arm, and collects a reward. Uh, the objective is to identify the, uh, a policy that maximizes the reward. And there are generally two approaches to address these questions. One is the pure exploration question, the objective of which is not to be concerned about the cumulative reward collected over time, but rather by identifying the best arm, which is the arm generally defined as the arm with the largest mean value. And the second one is the approach that somehow uh, uh, the balances exploration, exploitation, a dichotomy, and that is aiming at minimizing the uh, regret. Um, more formally, so if we have K arms, each of them with a population distribution that was shown by one of these plots, uh, the objective of regret minimization with respect to the base arm, uh, which we denote by arm with index ASR, is to look at the cumulative reward and subtract it from the best uh, reward that one could hope for associated with the best arm and the difference gives us the regret and the objective is to minimize the regret. On the other hand, in the pure exploration problems, the objective is uh, somehow agnostic this reward and tries to identify uh, the arm with the largest mean value with the fewest number of samples or measurements. So, in this talk, I'll be focusing on the second category of problems, uh, best uh, arm identification or BAI problems. All right. So, they appear in many uh, applications in which we face a number of decisions, and the objective is to identify the best decision, the best policy. Uh, that could appear, for instance, in drug discovery. Uh, you one would be interested in identifying a drug. Uh, formula that has the best clinical result, recommendation system that try to find the best match for the clients, and so forth. Now, the BI problems generally are investigated under two broad settings, the fixed computer setting and the fixed budget setting. So in the fixed budget setting, the uh, uh, constraint is that we have a limited number of samples that you could collect from the arms. Let's say that you're given 100 tries, and based on that, you have to come up with a policy that identifies the best decision or maximizes the, uh, the uh, quality of the decision given the fixed number of samples. On the other hand, we have the confidence intervals, which we don't limit the number of samples. On the other hand, we have the target reliability for the decision. Let's say that we want to identify the best arm with 90% accuracy. Then the objective becomes identical or determining a sampling policy and a stopping rule based on which the probability that you make a wrong decision will be controlled below a certain pre-specified pressure delta. Right. Now, so in this slide, we will be focusing on the fixed uh, confidence approaches. Now, the fixed confidence approaches themselves can be categorized into parametric versus non-parametric models. Under the non-parametric models, we don't uh, uh, make any assumption about the functional form of the distribution, for instance, the periods are assumed to be unknown. Uh, we need assumptions of the class of distributions nevertheless, for instance, of the absent distributions, distributions with bounded variance, and so forth. And on the other hand, in the parametric cases, we assume that we know the functional form of the distributions, but the parameters of the distribution are unknown. For instance, Gaussian bandits, in which the distributions are uh, 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 Gaussian, but the mean values are unknown. So, uh, the talk will have two parts. One, uh, which will be we're looking at the optimality results, and that we'll be focusing on the parametric case. And then later on robustness, which we'll be focusing on the non parametric case. All right. Uh, uh, 
for completeness, uh, since I'll be using also this later, let me just make a brief comment about the general approaches in the uh, non-parametric side. So there are generally two approaches for addressing non-parametric settings. One is the confidence interval-based approaches. So we are not making any assumption about the distributions. And uh, the methodology works as follows, that as we collect samples, we form an estimate for the mean value of each distribution. And based on that, we create a confidence interval around the estimate. And the objective is to collect samples as, uh, as long as these uh, confidence intervals, at least the one associated with the best arm, as it overlaps with the, the competing one. So samples are collected to resolve such an overlap. The moment that the overlap is gone, that's usually the stopping time of the process. The second category of uh, approaches are uh, successive elimination based. That is, you start with collecting or uh, considering all arms of potential candidates, collect samples, generally identifying the best arm based on finite samples is very hard, but eliminating sums that are considered non-promising is easier. So we successively eliminate those that we think are not good candidates until we narrow down to the smallest or ideally is only one arm and that becomes the decision. So this is the second category, which is called elimination based. All right, now uh, on the parametric side, also there are two general approaches known as track and a sub and talk to sampling. So track and a sub works based on the following, that it tries to track the optimal allocation of uh, samples across the arms, right? That's where the track and a sub comes from. Generally, they're shown to be asymptotically optimal when the error rate uh, approaches to zero, but their computation is extensive. So essentially, uh, solving each of uh, allocations over time requires solving generally a complicated optimization problem that renders the whole, the whole problem uh, computationally extensive. On the other hand, to partly address the computational aspect, the two top sampling approaches have emerged over the past few years. Uh, they compromise the optimality result, specifically they don't achieve asymptotic optimality that we have in the track and stop approaches, but they're computationally efficient and they work based on the following uh, 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 you know, uh, methodology that over time, they constantly identify a candidate for the best arm that is considered leader and a contender for that, which is generally called the challenger. And then the sampling strategy tries to randomly select either their leader or challenger over time, and that approach generally is uh, shown to be asymptotic uh, up to a certain constant, which I got into uh, in a couple of minutes. All right. So the track and stock approach works based on the following uh, methodology. So it tries to find a weight, set of weights, which essentially capture the fraction of the sampling resources allocated to different arms. So you can think of it as normalized frequency or frequency of the samples of different arms over time. So based on that, uh, generally there's a policy that maps these probabilities into arm selection, generally picking the best arm. Based on that, when an arm is selected, a reward is collected. Based on that, the mean values are estimated. These mean value estimation lead how to reallocate sampling resources in the time, the next time is slot, and the same cycle continues until the solved. Now, as I mentioned, each of these cycles for every T, we have to solve a mini maximum optimization problem. It doesn't have a close form solution, so it requires a computational approach generally a bisection method to solve each of the optimization problems. And then the computational complexity of that problem for achieving epsilon accuracy is scaling with k log of one or epsilon. So you'll see that with uh, decreasing epsilon, this will be exploding, right? So the, comp the computational complexity is high. Now, on the other hand, there are the two, uh, the top two sampling methods, so which have a much easier structure. They work as, as follows. So over time, they identify a top arm. I'll get into that, how that is selected, and a challenger. So once the two are identified, randomly one of them is uh, selected for sampling. So essentially, you can think of 
generating a Bernoulli random variable with a parameter beta, and you pick one of them, and once that is picked, the arm is selected, the reward is collected. Okay. Now, these approaches are optimal, asymptotically, what we call beta optimal, that depends on this beta, which is somehow a tuning parameter of the algorithm. Right? So if you want to solve the exact problem, that beta value itself should be also um, estimated or optimized. Right? But the general uh, you know, strategies are known to be only beta optimal. That is, you fix beta, and based on that, you find the policy. Uh, there are, uh, as you can see over the last two, three years, there has been extensive uh, literature, these are representatives, that try to find with, uh, come up with different ways on identifying the leader, the top contender, and the challenger for that, based on different metrics. Some use information measures, some use posterior probability, for instance. We did a work that we use likelihood ratio as the measure. And uh, there is the rewards that use transportation costs and so forth. So there is there are different methodology, but in, in all of them, the common message is that they can uh, they can achieve only asymptotic beta optimality. That is beta must be a known parameter. But then uh, the choice of beta can significantly influence the, uh, uh, the, the the performance of the algorithm. For instance, these are uh, the two state of the art algorithms. Uh, that are taught to achieving beta optimality. Their sample complexity is depicted versus variations in beta. As you can see, for uh, you know different variations, the value of the sample complexity could be different by a factor two or three, which is significant. Right? So, and that is observed across all implementations for, of different algorithms. You'll see that. So. Uh, Essentially, this picture highlights that knowing beta is critically important, right? It's not just a simple parameter in, to which the quality of the, or the performance of the algorithm is insensitive. So, um, so I think I'm missing one caption here. So, we address essentially the shortcoming of these existing problems by addressing two challenges. One is that we design an algorithm that is agnostic to beta, that essentially as a byproduct estimates the optimal value of beta. And secondly, we analyze a broader family of distributions. So the existing algorithms generally apply to only Gaussian and Bernoulli, some of them to also exponential family, but that is the extent of the results. So what we do is to generalize the results to beyond the exponential family of distributions. All right, so in designing the BI algorithms, we face three decisions intertwined. One is the sampling rule, that is how to identify the samples to be selected over time. The other one is the stopping rule, when we can confidently stop the uh, sampling process and declare one of the arms as the best arm, and then how to determine that arm, the terminal decision rule. Right? So the objective will be designing these three rules. Uh, now, the methodology uh, works as follows, and that is something that is also common to some of the existing approaches. I'll mention that to give some context about uh, how we solve the problem. So let's assume that A star is the best arm. Okay. So corresponding to that, we define an alternative set, which is a set of all bandwidth realizations in which A star is not the best arm. So every other possible realization whose best arm is something other than A star. And based on that, we select one instance, new bar from this alternative set. And based on that, we define a measure which is defined, specified, or called as uh, the problem complexity. So the, uh, the, the way that the complexity, problem complexity is defined is as follows. So consider every arm in the instance that we are dealing with and the one that is selected from the alternative space. Okay, so PI and PI bar the measures associated with arm I, uh, real, re, the realization that we have, and the alternative. And compute the KL divergence between them. So essentially that's a measure of similarity. And then weight that by a constant WI. Later on, we will see that these WIs essentially are the fraction of resources that should be allocated to uh, uh, arm I. And then we look at this weighted sum of KL divergence measures. So collectively, this somehow shows the, a measure of similarity between the instance that we have and an alternative. Right? 
So now, uh, here, yes. you're assuming the total loss, you're assuming that A star is unique, right? A star is unique, yes. Yes, that's right. Now, over all possible alternative realizations in new bar, we find the one that minimizes this measure. So essentially, we identify the realization that is closest in distribution to the instance that we are working with. Somehow, this captures the, the hardest uh, distribution to distinguish from what from the realization that we're working with. And then we maximize it over all possible weighting factors WR. So delta K is a simplex, which means that now this WI is sum up to one. We are working with a convex combination of these divergence measures. And this supremum identifies the worst case uh, such measure. All right. Now, this measure captures the hardness of identifying the best arm in the following sense, that the sample complexity of the BAI problem scales inversely proportional to this problem complexity, right? So the uh, larger the value, the better, right? We want to identify larger measure, therefore that also justifies this maximization over all the weights uh, to minimize the sample complexity. All right. Now, that problem, interestingly, you can show that it can be reduced to a simpler problem. The difference between the two is that here, the inner summation looks at the weighted sum of all uh, arms. Now, if you look at the you know, topological structure of these measures, you will see that uh, we have two opposing behavior among them. For the best arm, somehow, this is this will be an increasing function in WIs. And for the rest of them, for the second to the to the others, they will be also uh, decreasing in WRs. So leveraging that uh, uh, observation, the inner summation, including the fact that eventually we're doing a maximization, could be simplified into finding the ways of only two divergence measures. The one associated with the best arm, and then the one associated with uh, the second best arm. Okay? So, Finding the weights uh, that somehow or the weights w that maximize this summation could be reduced identi to identifying two measures that maximize only the sum of these two divergence measures. Right? Now, the way the state, the state of the art works is the, as follows, and that's where the notion of weight optimality comes. They fix the weight of the best associated with the best R. So WASR is assumed to be fixed. They force it to be beta. What that means is that they control that over time, beta fraction of the samples are collected from the best R. And then the remaining one minus beta will be allocated to all other arms collectively. So if we fix beta, which means that solving this parameter will be dispensed with, we will be left with only identifying WI that captures the second best R, and that becomes a tractable problem. There are algorithms that achieve the allocation of the one minus beta fractional resources over the remaining algorithms, and they provide the beta optimality guarantee. Okay. So what we try to do here is to see what is the best choice of essentially how to estimate beta itself. Okay, okay. so we bring in some of the key ideas that we know from sequential statistics, essentially sequential hypothesis testing. So in a way, this problem can be posed as sequential composite testing, right? So on there, essentially, we are dealing with K distributions uh, denoted by PIs. Each of them is specified up to an unknown parameter mu i, which is the average of the distribution. We denote the set of all rewards collected up to time t across all different arms by x t. And then we have the sequential hypothesis testing problem. That is hypothesis i corresponding to r i posing the following question Is r i the best r? Right? So it is composite because some of the parameters of the model are unknown. And the objective is to test whether it's a, whether it's a correct hypothesis or an incorrect hypothesis, or overall across all the k uh, hypotheses, uh, which one is the winning hypothesis? Okay, so we pose that so that uh, you know uh, uh, modeling is very natural, but that allows us to bring some ideas from sequential statistics as solved. So we know that likelihood ratio functions essentially are very effective for resolving hypotheses in in, in the composite space. 
So we define the likelihood function associated with distributive hypothesis H phi as follows. So it is the overall joint distribution of the entire data, assuming that hypothesis HI is true, that is arm I is the best arm, and then we maximize it over all possible hypotheses. That is over all possible distributions over which arm I has the largest mean value. Okay. Now, given two different hypotheses or two different arms, I mean the uh, candidates arm I and J, we define a likelihood ratio also, that is the ratio of like lambda, tau, uh, lambda t of i and lambda t of j, uh, and then you know, uh, up to the logarithm to give us like likelihood ratio test. So, corresponding to each pair of arms, we form a log likelihood ratio, uh, ratio value, which we denote by lambda t of i and j. And then, corresponding to r i at every time t, we identify the set of superior arms relative to r i. That is all other arms whose mean values or our estimates of the mean values are larger than the estimate that we have for R. Okay. So with these ingredients, first we'll show that we can have a much simpler or a close form representation for lambda T I and J. So essentially we can see that based on the you know, relative choices of the estimates that we have for the mean values of arm, different arms. So mu ti is the estimate of the R mean value of ri at time i. So different, depending on the relative choices, we can have a simple decomposition that reduces to the ratios of conditional distribution. And uh, based on that, we have the following uh, sampling or a stopping rule also leads to sampling strategy. So in line with the talk to sampling methods, we identify a leader and a challenger, but from a, with a different perspective. So our top uh, leader or the leader arm is the arm that over time at time t, it has the largest uh, estimate for the mean value. And we look at the maximum likelihood estimate. Right? So we'll form the maximum likelihood estimate for the mean values of arms, identify the one with the largest one. And then we define the contender not necessarily the one that has the second largest uh, maximum likelihood estimate, but rather the one that is closest to the uh, uh, the, the, the top uh, arm in a uh, likelihood sense, right? So essentially, once you identify a top, we go back and look at this equation, right? So we have the numerator that is top, uh, arm, the rest arm, a top. And we identify an alternative arm such that this ratio will be minimized. Right? So it is closeness in a likelihood ratio test. And that somehow becomes uh, the key enabling uh, you know, technique that allows us to also estimate data. Now, once we form this as statistics, this is our stopping rule. It's essentially a thresholding stopping rule, uh, according to which we compute the likelihood ratio between the top and the contender arms. And we compare it with a constant that also grows over time. So, pictorially, the red curve is the sequence of the likelihood ratios. The blue curve is the constant that scales over time. And the first time that we exceed that threshold, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, algorithm stops and we declare an R. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, all the previous work assumed that the beta is known, right? Uh, and again, this is another empirical example showing that, for instance, beta, optimal beta here appears at around 0.3 as the optimal choice. Now, the question that we pose is that how efficiently can we estimate beta? Right? Assuming that, at least empirically, uh, observe that the sample complexity is quite sensitive to, to the choice of beta. All right, for that purpose, we define two information measures as follows. So define gamma as a set of all measures, probability measures over the real numbers. Okay, so you can think of pictorially as the rectangle. We divide it into two parts. So AL is a, the collection of all distributions whose mean is smaller than a, an arbitrary constant y. Okay, so therefore the partition that we have depends on the value of y. So you pick a value, positive value y, identify all the distributions whose means are smaller than y and put them in one of the partitions. 
And then the rest, which are essentially the distributions whose means are larger than y in the other one, right? Now, based on these two partitions, we define two information measures that we denote by du and dl. So what they do is that given any arbitrary probability measure p, we find the minimum distance of the p to two elements in these two partitions. So the first element, essentially with respect to al, which we denote by dl, would be the, the KL divergence between P and a member of LA, uh, AL, such that has the minimum, such that that uh, candidate eta has the minimum distance from P. And also likewise, we identify a member from AU that is closest to P in the KL divergence sense, okay? Now, what we can do is the following. So we can show that uh, the, Problem complexity measure that we had earlier can be further simplified and be described in terms of these CL and DU uh, functions. So specifically, that inner optimization that we have over the choices of WASR and WI can be represented by DU of P associated with the best arm, so essentially distribution of the best arm, and X, and WI, PI, and X, uh, where this value of x is in the range mu i and mu star. So essentially the mean of arm i and the mean of the best, okay? And then uh, we have identified the arm that has smallest such divergence that gives us the closest distribution to the real, the, the best distribution representing the, world, the, the hardest case for distinguishing the two distributions. And then we maximize over all allocations. So maximizing over W essentially tells us how to allocate the resources, right? Uh, so uh, now, as we have seen, this inner term, which for each uh, 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 arm I and uh, sampling uh, with W, we denote gamma I and W has two components. The first one, uh, is a distance to the closest alternative banded instance from the best arm. And the second one captures the distance to the closest alternative banded instance from arm I, okay? So you can think of it as partitioning arm I, A, partitioning arm I, and measure P, find the closest distance to these two distributions. All right. Now, based on that, this is how our algorithm essentially works. So over time, based on the data, we find the maximum likelihood estimate of the mean values at time t, we denote it by mu t. That serves as a basis for identifying the top uh, uh, contender. So the one with the largest uh, ML mean value. Uh, based on that, we compute allocation at time t. So that essentially depends on the estimates of W. So, uh, you know, uh, these estimates, if uh, at time t, when you multiply them by t, gives us essentially these uh, counters for the number of samples. Based on that, we find the empirical estimate for the problem complexity that we have for each arm. We identify the arm with the minimum divergence measure and then compute the corresponding sample comple uh, problem complexity measure. Right. So pictorially, it means that over time, for each arm i, we are computing this problem complexity measure, and at time t, we identify a t mean as the one that has the smallest gamma t. Okay. All right. So again, going back to the problem, the problem complexity formulation that, that we have, we can further simplify it, and you'll see that gamma t at time t, or the, the problem complexity at time t can be further simplified into this one. So the du, dl measures are as before. Now the weights, we have some candidates for them. These are essentially the counters that we have uh, for the top arm and the contender arm normalized by the number of times that we have played in the environment, right? Somehow they give us a sense of a frequency or probability values. All right, now, how can we ensure that based on this, we can have a good estimate for beta? And that is the really critical part associated with this sensing or going beyond beta optimality. 
Uh, we have a process, which we call a process for avoiding under exploration that works as follows. So at time t, we come, uh, specify a metric, which is square root of t divided by k, right? And then we say that an R is under explored if at time t it has been by, by time t it has been explored fewer than square root of t over k. Right? And then once that happens, we ensure that we don't leave any uh, arm under explored. That is, whenever at time t we have arms that are being under explored, we give them priority for sampling in the time access, uh, next time of slot. So essentially, we want to sample only if on the event, we assure that there is no undersampled R. That uh, somehow guarantees that we can find uh, reliable estimates for beta. So the critical difference that we have with the other methods, top two methods that somehow uh, uh, do not identify the best R is this uh, you know, process of avoiding under acceleration. Now, when every arm is explored sufficiently, it means that we can have reliable estimates for all arms, and based on that, we can identify the uh, optimal value of beta. So based on that, this is how the algorithm overall works. So we have reward. Based on that, you identify the top uh, 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 arm, contender arm, and then uh, Based on the two, we uh, essentially randomize, we select one of them, and then we continue the process. This is what we call transportation cost balancing algorithm. So going back, essentially we define this lambda t as the transportation cost over time, and this algorithm tries to balance these two terms over time. Right? And that's why it's called uh, transportation cost balancing. I'll see this. So, uh, I'll just mention that we have an improved version of that, which has the same uh, analytic guarantee, but has improved uh, empirical performance. Essentially, uh, by introducing the process that avoids under exploration, we tend to not to be too aggressive with exploration, rather actually be very conservative with exploration. But we see that if we add a penalty term that somehow uh, discourages sampling the arms that have been this, uh, identified so far or sampled so far according to this log ti of t. So ti is the number of, uh, so this term is the number of times that arm i has been sampled up to time t. By including that, somehow we are discouraging too much uh, under acceleration. Okay. So with that, we can further show that we can improve the uh, empirical performance. But same. Okay. And based on that, we can update the sampling part policy. All right. Now, performance guarantees. So earlier, I showed that uh, once the likelihood ratio exceeds a constant that scales over time, uh, that gives us the stopping rule. Now, if we choose that constant to behave logarithmically with t, specifically according to this equation, a constant c, which depends on another parameter alpha, I'll get to that momentarily. K minus one, K in the number of arms, T to power alpha, where T is a, a time index, divided by delta. If we set it like that, we get delta back guarantee. That is the error probability at the terminal decision is at most delta. Uh, we'll see that overall this uh, uh, constant is growing logarithmically with T. And then, uh, we have the following guarantee for the sample complexity. So sample complexity is captured by the expected value of the stopping time, normalized by log of 1 over delta. So essentially, we know that it scales with log of 1 over delta. We just want to see what the coefficient is, so we normalize by that. And then we look at the asymptotic behavior, that is when delta approaches to zero. Uh, we will see that we have an information theoretic lower bound on the sample complexity, which is one over this uh, problem complexity measure, and upper bounded by the same term, except that it is am amplified by a constant alpha larger than one. And what is it, the alpha? This is the alpha that also appeared in uh, this, uh, th the choice of the uh, threshold. So alpha is a number that could be arbitrarily close to one, but larger than one. What does that mean? That means that our uh, sample complexity is sandwiched between these two measures where alpha could be any larger 
any number larger than one. We can make it arbitrarily small, showing that actually it is optimal, right? The, the bounds are missing. Now, a comparison with, with beta optimality, the type of guarantees that beta optimality approaches have is that these two matrix in the denominator, the uh, problem complexity functions, will be replaced by some counterpart of that, which is gamma beta of nu. And that gamma beta is computed when you fix the allocation or the fraction of resources allocated to this arm to beta. And uh, it is, if beta turns out to be the optimal choice, these two become equal. Otherwise, gamma beta is a strictly smaller, meaning that the sample complexity will be larger. And this is the result showing the optimality of the sample complexity. Now, a couple of more observations. The key one being uh, the convergence of the estimates that we have for the allocation over time. So uh, Wi omega is the optimal allocation of resources to arm i given in standard instant w. And the fraction that we allocate based on our policy will be t sub t of i divided by t. <laughs> So we want to control that to be close enough. So essentially we force that to be, the force of difference to be smaller than epsilon for an epsilon that is arbitrarily small. We can ensure the following two observations, that there exists a time constant n that depends on epsilon for which for all arms, this condition is true. So there is a, a stochastic time. We don't know what it is, but we know that it exists after which all the estimates are within an epsilon band of the optimal allocation. So that includes the allocation for the best R, which means beta. Right? And then furthermore, we show that the expected value of this time instant is also finite. So in expectation, that time instance does happen. Our algorithm gets to the point after which all the estimates are at most off by a epsilon. Again, the most important uh, one among all of those estimates is the one associated with the best one, beta value. So this is somehow ensuring that we can estimate beta reliably. Uh, a number of empirical evaluations based on uh, uh, the, uh, or uh, evaluations of different metrics involving the problem. The first one is looking at the the very last result that I mentioned. So essentially difference between the empirical allocations and the optimal allocations. And so it is a k-dimensional measure for just simple representation. You look at the largest one of them. If you ensure that the largest one is small, it means that all of them are small, right? So we plot that versus t to see whether that actually converges. And we are uh, doing that for different uh, banded models. So we essentially look at three, Bernoulli models, three Gaussian models, and you'll see that convergence happens in all of them. Uh, estimation error, again, uh, doing something similar, uh, but uh, uh, essentially, uh, uh, let me see. Uh, so this is associated with the worst case of the arms. The, the next one is associated with beta, essentially, the best of, the convergence of the best. Again, you'll see that the estimate for beta converges uh, actually pretty fast over time for all different realizations. Uh, the important metric, which was the key element for us to decide how to design the samples or how to identify the samples was the transportation cost, which was the weighted sum of the k divergence measures, right, if you remember. So that one also we wanted to be converging to the optimal value, right? And this is a picture that shows that over all realizations that we have for different banded instances, Bernoulli Gaussian, the uh, uh, convergence is pretty fast. For this one to be an outlier, we have to really search to find an instance in which the convergence is slower, but overall the convergence is pretty fast for most of the realizations. Uh, the key uh, aspect that we have for ensuring that we have good estimates for all arms was the uh, under or avoiding under acceleration. So uh, our algorithm uh, sampled under sample arms 
Uh, so when we have no control over sampling, essentially in this slide, this is what I want to show. What happens if we don't enforce under sampling, right? We are saying that under sampling is helping us, but what if we don't enforce that? What do we get out of the algorithm? And we'll see that uh, if we don't do that, um, if we always sample, let's say, the best arm, uh, I have to remember what it was. So this is, again, the, uh, okay. So this is the estimation error corresponding to uh, uh, the, the transport cost function or the uh, problem complexity function gamma t. And you'll see that it will be growing, right? Um, so to summarize, I think I'm right at the 45 minutes. So we have looked into the PII problem. So that PII problem has been investigated under many scenarios. The specific setting that we have is fixed confidence parametric setting. Uh, we build upon the existing literature by extending the results in two dimensions. So the existing result depends on a tuning parameter beta and we have dispensed with that dependence. So the algorithms become, achieve the optimal performance without knowing the optimal value of beta. In fact, they produce an estimate of beta as the byproduct. And we generalize to distributions beyond the exponential family for which the performance guarantees are known. So all the beta optimality guarantees are limited only to the exponential family of distribution. We have generalized that, of course, up to some uh, assumptions on the distribution models. Um, we don't have any complicated uh, optimization process. So the algorithm constantly works based on updating the likelihood ratio values and based on that identifying the best arm, the content and arm, uh, therefore becoming computationally efficient and also asymptotic counting. So I have a second part in mind, but I'm just uh, uh, running late, so I'll stop here and I'll take questions. Uh, please thank the speaker for the wonderful talk. So I will open the floor for questions. Uh, even the audience online on Zoom can unmute and ask whenever their turn comes up. There's, an, there's a question in the audience here. After taking this question, I'll hand over to Zoom to see if there are any questions. Uh, just a simple question. Uh, what's your computational comparison of your TCP and ITCP? So, uh, the only computation that we have is the following uh, computing the likelihood ratio terms, right? So, it's pretty simple. So, especially when the distributions are known, which is the case here, we're working with parametric family of distributions. It just means that taking the sample, plugging into this function, and uh, solving uh, the problem. Right? So you'll see that the stopping time depends on completing this likelihood ratio, right? And then uh, finding the estimates for the transport cost depends on only finding the or updating the counter for the number of samples, which is just one update normalizing by time, looking at these measures, right? Uh, so for identifying a mean, if we want to solve this numerically, of course, that will be difficult. But again, we saw that we can avoid it. So pictorially, yeah. So this is a t mean, which will be the solution of this optimization problem. Essentially, will be the smallest empirical estimate that we have for gamma t. And then we have to estimate all these measures. So the most complicated part essentially becomes the maximum likelihood estimate of the mean values. So that every time we have to run k ml estimators. Once we have k l estimators, we compute all the allocation counters, right? And then estimates for w, which essentially will be this capital T sub T divided by T, they become the estimates for W. And then once we have those, we can plug them in this equation, right, to find gamma T and so forth. So going back to the heart of your question, the most complicated part is the maximum likelihood estimate part. 
So uh, continuing on that note, uh, what if the ML estimates are not computable in closed form? Uh, so there are there are like many because you tend to extend beyond the uh, exponential families. So doesn't that problem arise when we look at general class of distributions? So that would be a challenge. Yes. If the ML estimates are complicated to find, that will become the bottleneck for us, right? But there are many also computationally efficient approaches for maximum likelihood estimation. So, you know, posterior, uh, 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 you know, estimations, etc. Variational methods, especially. So, what, what if the ML estimates are replaced by just plugging estimates of, you know, the Empirical, the total required divided by the total times, the total number of times an arm is pulled. Most likely for us, that won't work because we are working with the likelihood ratio terms. Uh, and likelihood ratio terms, they show their best properties when uh, these are maximum likelihood estimates. Right? So essentially, likelihood terms are our key metrics. And we always want to capture or allocate resources based on tracking the best arms. And the best arms are the ones that show the largest likelihood values. And for that, ML becomes a natural choice. And uh, generally in the analysis, especially the, uh, the part where it involves showing the delta pack property, mm -hmm. I've seen that in some of the proofs, there is one step where this test statistic mm -hmm. at any given time is replaced with. So, if we look at this test statistic and normalize it by t, for example, uh, that is 1 by t lambda t. 1 okay. by t times lambda t. Uh -huh. That is generally shown to be the, uh, uh, the value of that 1 by t times lambda t generally happens to be uh, the, if we look at the original. Uh, Transportation cost. Mm -hmm. It is generally t times of that. So lambda t is t times of that transportation cost, and that is one of the key properties which is generally used in the proofs. Uh, so our proofs are quite different. Uh, so for us, you'll see that. So look at the allocation, right? So for us, uh, so you mean that? So so all I want to know is. Is the the inner the gamma i of uh, you know new comma w whatever you uh -huh. have uh -huh. when we plug in the estimates of mu and w that uh -huh. is mu hat and w so there is no w hat for you uh, actually there is no value hat so we do estimate right so it appears to be, to be here uh, so this is essentially the estimate for w's right correct. So that is also uh, the, the point I wanted to ask is if we do t times of this, that is, if we look at t times so gamma essentially t, can there. Yeah. So is that part actually the test statistic corresponding to time t is what I want to know. So you mean t times this ratio, which means capital so T. So multiply both sides by t. Okay. So get rid of these get t's in the denominators. Okay. So the uh, resulting term. Is that equal to uh, the test statistic of time t? That's what I want to know. The test statistic, you mean the likelihood ratio? The likelihood ratio between the top and the uh, mean. Because I see that your test statistic of time t is essentially max min lambda t over j. So the max is over i and min is over j. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct, but I'm not sure if this simplifies to likelihood ratio. Okay. I don't think it simplifies to that okay. mm, Quite likely it does not because it depends on this divergence measure. So uh, you, you somehow balance the, uh, the frequencies of all the arms other than the mean and the top through forced exploration, is it? So yes, so that is the idea to balance essentially between the best arm and the rest of them. Yeah, because like you pointed during the talk, if only the best arm is sampled, or if there is a beta probability of choosing between best and the second best, right. it is very unlikely that the arm selection frequencies of all the other arms 
will reach the correct frequencies. The correct, the lower they will reach the correct frequencies, assuming that collectively they have one minus beta fraction, right? If you do beta optimality, so if you fix beta. But then that is not necessarily optimal because beta is not necessarily optimal. Okay. Are there any questions from the audience on Zoom? Okay, it looks like there aren't any questions. So on that note, uh, we thank Professor Ali again for the excellent talk. Thank you very much. I'm now going to stop the recording.